Hello, my name is Aydab Ghaffar. I am a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Foreign Policy Program, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's campus here in Qatar. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, virtually hosted by the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings. Europe has had economic, political, and strategic relations with the Gulf Cooperation Council since it was established in 1981. More than four decades later, and despite showing early promise, a host of domestic, regional, and international factors have relegated the GCC to the periphery of the European Union's foreign policy. From the GCC side, its relationship with the EU was also never a priority. This is due to the lack of internal cohesion uh, between Gulf states, as we've seen from the Gulf crisis, uh, and also the prioritization of relations with other actors, such as the US and increasingly China, as well as bureaucratic inefficiencies in the organization itself. What we have seen is that Gulf countries and European countries have bypassed these multilateral mechanisms and instead opted to deepen their engagement and relations at a bilateral level. Is it possible to revitalize EU GCC relations? What are the obstacles and what are the areas of most promise? How can Europe play a larger role in supporting GCC, the GCC countries' development plans and the transition to a post-oil uh, economy? What role can Europe play uh, in the security architecture of the region and what are the limitations of such a role? To answer some of these questions, Sylvia Colombo from the International Affairs Institute in Rome and myself have edited a volume published by Palgrave uh, late last year titled The European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council Towards a New Path. Uh, this volume brought a number of experts to discuss many of these issues. Uh, and today we are very lucky to have two of these experts uh, where we'll expand in this webinar uh, on and discuss many of these uh, questions. I would like to first introduce our speakers. Uh, Courtney Freer is a postdoc fellow at Emory College and a non-resident fellow at Brookings. Omar El Obaydeli is the director of research at the Bahrain Center for Strategic International and Energy Studies and an affiliated associate uh, professor at George Mason, Mason University, and my friend and colleague and co-editor Sylvia Colombo is a senior fellow at the International Affairs Institute in Rome. I would like to welcome you all. Starting with Sylvia, then Courtney, then Omar, each speaker will have introductory comments for about seven minutes or so. Then we will open for discussion and questions from the audience. Please send your questions via the Zoom function uh, in uh, the, the chat function in Zoom, as well as uh, using the hashtag EUGCC on Twitter as well as sending an email to events at brookings.edu. We've already received a number of questions uh, and we encourage you to send more. Sylvia, I'll start with you, please, go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much, Adel, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks to the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings for uh, hosting this event. Um, and uh, many thanks to uh, the participants and the speakers uh, uh, for their insights uh, uh, also in view of the of the book that we uh, worked together uh, during 2021. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to present some of these insights and also to continue the discussion uh, on a topic uh, that is definitely unfolding and uh, uh, there are uh, news uh, uh, every every day. As Adel said, um, and as we thoroughly discussed in the book, multilateral relations between the uh, European Union on the one hand and the Gulf Cooperation Council countries or the Gulf more broadly have uh, failed uh, so far. There are a number of reasons for that that we explore in the book. Uh, ranging from uh, uh, the fact that bilateralism has uh, trumpeted uh, multilateral engagement uh, with the national agendas uh, taking, pre taking precedence over um, uh, multilateral cooperation. The second aspect that we analyze is the fact that up until at least the first decade of the 2000s, uh, this agenda that has been uh, of cooperation has been mostly uh, overtaken or concentrated on uh, economic uh, and uh, financial issues, uh, while uh, little attention was uh, given uh, to political, people-to-people -people engagement uh, uh, or uh, security uh, cooperation. Uh, finally, there is also the, the point of uh, with whom uh, Europe has engaged with in the Gulf, uh, which goes, uh, uh, as in many other types of relations, uh, uh, with the fact that the U.S. mostly engaged at the uh, authorities level, uh, 
uh, and has neglected the engagement with the society, broadly speaking. This has created uh, gaps in the cooperation and uh, a long history of failure, uh, low-key cooperation and growing mutual distrust, I would say. Yet, as we have have uh, heard uh, in recent months, uh, there have been announcements coming out from Brussels that uh, a new era of engagement uh, with the, the GCC is opening up. Uh, you might recall that in early uh, October, um, top diplomats from Brussels, including the High Representative uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, visited uh, four countries of three countries in the GCC, uh, trying really to uh, unleash uh, a, new, a, new, a new path for cooperation. Um, however, I would say that uh, these, uh, uh, again, has raised many expectations, but these expectations have not been met with uh, concrete uh, outcomes. Uh, and uh, one of the major points that we need to take into account is the need to consider the broad environment and how uh, the history of cooperation between the UN and the GCC needs really to be put in the context of uh, broader geopolitical issues. I will focus with my, in my comments uh, mostly on the security aspect and the security side of cooperation, knowing that my uh, fellow panelists will delve on other dimensions of the, of the, relationship. Uh, the relationship. Uh, talking about security, it's clear that the Gulf, broadly speaking, represents a dilemma for uh, the EU, uh, and any cooperation with the Gulf is actually perceived more as a, as a, as a risk uh, than as an opportunity. Why is it that? Uh, first of all, as I said, that there are many stumbling blocks in the way in which the relation between uh, Europe and the Gulf has been constructed in the past few years, and in particular the, the multilateral relations uh, between the EU and the GCC. Uh, there are internal problems in the way in which uh, the EU functions when it comes to foreign and security policy. And third aspect, uh, which is very important in my view, is the fact that the Gulf security dynamics do not immediately translate into threats uh, for the EU and the EU member states. Hence, the EU does not consider uh, the region as strategically important. Uh, it does so rhetorically, but it does not ultimately behave as if the region uh, were uh, strategically important, contrary to other more proximate uh, and challenges with the region, such as North Africa, the Sahel, or Israel-Palestine for that matter. Yet we know that if we take the global picture, the Gulf is indeed important in security terms, also for the EU. And the number, again, there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, many of the security challenges that we see in the Gulf are actually anchored in global dynamics of competition for resources. Take the issue of energy dynamics and shifting uh, balances of power in the way energy is uh, uh, traded, consumed, and so on and so forth and also uh, shifting balances of power and global threats, such as the non-proliferation issue. So all these are present uh, when it comes to the Gulf, and the EU is well aware of that. Second, um, the Gulf has become, uh, in the past decade or even more, the center of gravity of the Middle East and North Africa uh, regional security dynamics. Uh, this was not the case uh, when the EU developed its relations to the MENA, uh, uh, which tended to exclude the Gulf, uh, i.e. the European neighborhood uh, during the uh, 1990s and the early 2000s. But now, uh, speaking from at least since 2011, uh, the Gulf has, became, uh, has taken a center stage in these security dynamics uh, uh, that extend a much broader region that it's very close and very important for the EU, being its neighborhood. Uh, if we take the example of the conflicts that uh, are still um, ongoing or uh, in a freezing mode in this region from Syria, Libya uh, to the Eastern Mediterranean, indeed, these conflicts do have their own specific dynamics, but they are also in one way or another tied and tangled with Gulf influences and interferences. Last but not least, Gulf security represents a test for the EU uh, common foreign security policy. And again, take the example of the Yemeni conflict uh, and the, the, the real catastrophe that has, has happened in, uh, in Yemen. And this shows very well where, uh, that, um, what happens when the Gulf countries decided to go uh, alone. Uh, they have different policies vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, but also when individual European member states follow these uh, Gulf uh, kind of individual policies. And the EU also 
uh, offers its backing. Uh, given these challenges and the fact that in one way or another the, uh, the Gulf remains central to uh, security dynamics, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge also that in 2021, uh, regional circumstances and regional uh, trends have started to shift and there have been openings of dialogue and mediation that we have seen also happening in the Gulf. And the EU has uh, uh, the potential now to um, contribute better to security in the Gulf by acknowledging what it can do or what it sh and, uh, shouldn't do at the same time and by first and foremost having clear priorities and uh, uh, um, recognizing that it can only uh, nurture and support these windows of opportunities uh, that are endogenous to the region. Uh, three aspects need to be taken into account when doing that. First uh, is the aspect of the co cooperation with the uh, US which I think uh, currently will shed more light on how the triangulation between the EU, uh, Washington and the Gulf uh, is currently uh, moving and whether there is room for uh, the EU and the, uh, the uh, US to uh, work together on security issues in the, in the Gulf, knowing that this has been for long and it remains a domain in US, US hands. Second aspect is that EU can offer um, um, a contribution in terms of uh, uh, security dynamics in the Gulf because it has a broader, tends to have a broader understanding of security uh, beyond the purely our security threats or matters. In this sense, uh, economy, climate change, energy diversification, uh, locally tailored approaches are all uh, aspects that the EU can leverage because it has uh, these are key as key policies in its toolkit. Third aspect that needs to be taken into account when looking for a, a new entry point, new entry points for the EU to uh, engage in security uh, with the Gulf is the fact that uh, quick fixes or uh, short term solutions will not work, as we have seen in the case of the uh, of restoring the JCPOA or keeping the JCPOA alive. This is a process that has been going on and the EU uh, should continue to engage with a long term uh, perspective because this is the only way to really unlock gradually the potential of cooperation with the Gulf. Of course, uh, a number of areas could be explored to do the, that in concrete terms. I would, I would say that uh, um, there are two that hold the most potential, given the fact that multilateral cooperation is blocked on many fronts. The first aspect is, of course, the aspect of nuclear safety and non-proliferation, uh, which goes in the line of keeping the JCPOA alive, alive but also working uh, uh, also and being prepared uh, to, to move forward, even in case is the JCPOA is not uh, will not be there in the, in the next few um, months and years. And the second aspect that the EU uh, is quite prepared to do is really to exploit its maritime strategy, which already exists, and to uh, kind of expand it uh, and use it as the launching pad uh, to undertake uh, actions and, uh, in, uh, in maritime security, uh, knowing that it has already a mission, uh, the MSO mission in, in place, uh, uh, since 2020 and the, that many member states are contributing to that. So one way it would be to really multilateralize uh, this mission, which is already uh, really uh, been uh, ap appropriated in one way or another by Brussels, in order to uh, infuse into that all the knowledge and the experience of, of the EU in this domain, and also to make uh, use, better use of uh, the approaches uh, that the, of the member states. Um, I will stop here and I'll be happy to continue the conversation on the uh, take questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. Courtney? Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Great to see you all. Um, so my chapter in the volume examines the nature and extent of intra-legislative ties between the EU and various GCC parliaments and elected consultative bodies. And I think that this is an area of, con of cooperation that's often overlooked in favor of focus on higher profile trade and security relationships. And certainly those ties are important, uh, especially as we've seen in the past few months, a rise in bilateral arms sales from various European countries to the Gulf. Um, nonetheless, I think it's important to highlight certain delegations from the European Parliament that have conducted for years uh, official visits with legislatures in Bahrain, Kuwait, and Oman, as well as with the Shura Council in Saudi Arabia, in addition to having more informal visits with Qatar's previously unelected Shura Council and the partially elected Federal National Council of the UAE. 
I see the development of these ties as an important means of creating cross-border cooperation, highlighting, highlighting legislative best practices, and enhancing knowledge about current events across two very different but increasingly interconnected regions. Um, so the GCC, as you probably know, hosts a variety of political systems, ranging from the more participatory Kuwaiti environment to the more authoritarian Saudi system. Due to these variations, the European Parliament has negotiated different relationships with each member state and with their associated elective, elected bodies. And so we see again, bilateralism reigning. And this is one of the themes of the volume. And I think one of the themes that we, we find when we look at EU Gulf relations in general. Um, in terms of bilateral ties, I think it's worth pointing out where the EU has delegation offices in the GCC. So there are two offices initially in Saudi Arabia and in the UAE. And as of 2019, the EU opened a new delegation office in Kuwait uh, in an effort to expand its presence across the Middle East. Um, and I think this is also notable because Kuwait was neutral during the GCC crisis, which was ongoing in 2019 when this office was established. But I think the fact that the EU does have three delegation offices in, in you know, three of the six GCC states indicates that there is a desire to continue uh, engagement and to continue this engagement at the ground level, which I think is really important. Um, and regarding uh, particularly the relationship with Kuwait, one area of cooperation we've seen between the EU and Kuwait is on reconstruction of, uh, of Iraq, the conference in 2018, which Kuwait hosted to kind of raise funds um, to help with reconstruction in Iraq was something that the EU was quite, uh, uh, quite involved in as well. And so this is one area where we've seen bilateralism, which could potentially uh, turn into multilateralism because there is a desire for regional security and stability kind of everywhere. Um, the largest obstacle to greater multilateral times, uh, ties on the political level at the time I wrote the chapter was, of course, the GCC crisis, um, because this was ongoing. And of course, it's very difficult to have multilateral cooperation when the multilateral body is divided. Um, even in the existing environment, we're about a year out from the Alula agreement, which ended the GCC crisis. Um, and I think perhaps in light of some shared challenges throughout the region due to the pandemic, I think some areas for potential multilateral cooperation, especially in the intra-parliamentary field are emerging. Um, these include discussion both across the GCC and with members of European Parliament about means of implementing austerity measures while protecting society's most vulnerable members. Cooperation could also advance in efforts to nationalize workforces in a sustainable way, as well as to care for migrant worker populations which seem to be particularly at risk. I think another area of, of potential cooperation is making progress towards the European Green Deal and GCC states goals with very ambitious goals that they've set to reduce carbon emissions. Um, and I think overall multilateral initiatives on these apolitical, largely apolitical issues, more economic issues that are critical still to legislators and to legislators may represent a really important opportunity for collaboration. Um, we could also see potential cross-border, you know, efforts at humanitarian efforts in places like Yemen and Syria, where there's still disagreement politically, but there is still a, a need in terms of uh, the humanitarian side. Um, in terms of bilateral ties, um, they seem to be most harmed in those countries where European Parliament delegations have at certain times been critical of human rights abuses. And in the chapter, I detail this in the Bahraini and Saudi Arabian cases in the past. In such states, we've seen engagement with elected officials, rather than merely with the unelected uh, um, political leadership, I think would be particularly useful in getting a more nuanced views of these countries and the challenges facing them. Indeed, people ask all the time, you know, what is public opinion like in Saudi Arabia? Uh, and I think in, in that sense, it would be really helpful to have more engagement um, with, you know, Shura council members, with other people on the ground in Saudi. And in the past, when there have, when the EU and European parliament in particular has been critical of human rights abuses, um, this has stymied uh, some cooperation between on, on the bilateral level. Um, but I think overall, the European Parliament is uniquely placed to enhance ties beyond ruling elites. And indeed, as long as its members are provided access inside the countries in question, which they have been uh, to now, uh, they should make an effort to expand links beyond the leadership of elected bodies so that broader issues linked to human rights, economic well-being, and even foreign policy can be approached with a greater understanding informed by broader based discussions rather than just discussions at the top level. Um, and I think in places where ac if access does become blocked um, or where criticism is disregarded, 
there's also an, an opportunity for engagement with diaspora populations uh, across Europe, and that could also potentially help inform European Parliament's relations with both parliaments and leaderships across the region. But I think overall, trying to deepen relationships beyond just the top level political officials would be uh, would be useful and focusing on kind of more economic uh, multilateral initiatives could be helpful. So I'll stop there and we can pick up a lot of other issues uh, in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Courtney and Sylvia, for giving us the, the, the contours of the, the relationship and its political uh, dimensions. I think this is a perfect time to uh, get Omar in on the conversation to speak about uh, the economic side of things and the economic relationship uh, and how it has uh, developed or has not uh, developed. Please go ahead. Good morning and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to contribute today. And I very much appreciate listening to Sylvia and to Courtney. Uh, in terms of the economics, uh, so I would say the EU used to have uh, a clear policy when it came to its uh, economic expansion. You have to bear in mind that the EU, especially after enlargement, is a huge economy. And so it doesn't, you know, it gets most of what it wants internally in terms of its trade. Uh, it doesn't need to uh, pursue trade relationships for economic purposes in the same way that the GCC might have to or, or a small country would like Singapore. Uh, and so this has allowed it to um, use its trade policy historically as a tool to advance non, ostensibly non-economic goals. Uh, for example, it wants to promote uh, multilateralism. Uh, it wants to promote, uh, uh, as Courtney mentioned, human uh, and worker rights. Uh, it wants to protect the environment or pr promote the protection of the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, that was an important theme of relations or uh, negotiations, for example, with the GCC throughout the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, but to be honest, the EU now uh, seems to be paralyzed. Um, you know, so Sylvia gave a perspective as, as an EU citizen living in the EU. I'll give a perspective as somebody living out, looking at the EU from the outside. Uh, to be honest, it, can't, it doesn't need to be able to sort itself out internally. You know, it's got problems with Hungary, Poland, and various other countries. It can't seem to sort out its energy problems. I mean, it's, it's to be honest, uh, it's, it's, I would almost describe it as embarrassing what, what happened this winter with, uh, with, with the energy shortages. Uh, and it can't even sort out its issues with, you know, Russia, Ukraine, NATO. I mean, it's just sitting by like a, uh, like a deer in the headlights with what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. And I see absolutely no decisive action, no formal stance. Uh, the US is doing the only pushback that is being articulated to, you know, against Russia regarding uh, Ukraine seems to be coming from the US. Uh, and I have no idea what the EU is hoping to achieve. I don't even know if the EU knows itself what it wants to achieve, to be frank. Uh, I don't have the expertise to analyze the reasons why, uh, you know, the EU doesn't seem to be able to get it, doesn't even seem to be able to get, get out of its own way. Uh, uh, but uh, the implications, at, normally speaking, are not good in terms of getting a deal with the GCC, uh, the you know, long, longer awaited FTA. Uh, first of all, it, you know, such, such sort of negotiations would have a low priority because, as I say, the EU doesn't seem to be able to get out of its own way at the moment and it can't even solve the pressing issues domestically or on its borders, let alone, you know, trying to do something with the GCC, which is quite far away. Uh, they can't agree on anything internally, it would seem, uh, and they don't even know what they want individually, <laughs> even, even setting aside the coordination problem. I don't even think the individual member states have a clear sense of what they want from the GCC, to be honest. Uh, I, I get the, you know, we've had in, in, in Bahrain, you know, as a researcher working in a think tank, we've had contact with the EU. I've, I've, I've sensed an impetus from the EU to, and you know, Courtney mentioned the, the increase in the number of missions and, you know, and, and they want people on the ground. And as someone living at the UCC, I have sensed what she's describing, but I also get the sense that it's more bureaucratically driven than it is politically driven. I get the sense that the people in the, you know, the bureaucrats who work in the diplomatic entities and the high office and, and all its uh, high commission and its, all its organs and so on and so forth, they have worked out that, you know, we. Let's try and do something. Let's pick up the ball. Let's keep things rolling. But I don't get anything from the high heads of state from the European Council. I, I just see disinterest or, or, uh, or, or preoccupation. Now, I would like to say preoccupation, but the problem is I don't even see them doing 
particularly well in tackling the other problems. So I'm really not sure. There seems to be a paralysis in the EU. It's very sad because uh, as a GCC citizen who very much cherishes uh, GCC integration, GCC integration is supposed to be you know, significantly easier than EU integration because we are much more homogenous culturally, linguistically, religiously, economically than the EU. And so we've always looked to the EU People like me who are in favor of integration have always looked to the EU as an example. And to be honest, what the EU has done in the last you know, 75 years is genuinely remarkable. Uh, and I always uh, am amazed at how, you know, when you read about you know, the state that Europe was in 1945 and, 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 and how far they've come and just, you know, just avoiding. Uh, you know, when I've been to Brussels recently and just before COVID, uh, I, if, and it was the first time I'd been you know, since, I think, 2000, I really felt uh, a sense uh, I don't know how representative it was, but a sense of an EU identity, a European identity. I think the EU and the European Commission had successfully created some sense of a European identity. But uh, uh, so that's why it's sad to see things, uh, you know, not going that way anymore of late. Hopefully it's something transient. Uh, now, in terms of the GCC side, the GCC still broadly has the same goals as before. Um, which is, you know, and these are mentioned on the security side. I mean, Sylvia was right that the EU, the GCC side have always wanted, you know, external security, but, you know, the US has been providing that for a while. Now, in principle, they should want that even more from the, the EU. Uh, but I want to also say is that there's an accentuated economic need for access to a large market. So whereas, you know, in 2008 uh, or 2009, I think is when the uh, GCC unilaterally broke off negotiations with the EU regarding an FTA, oil prices were high. Uh, and that, you know, the, the economic diversification was like, yeah, it'd be nice if we diversified, but you know, it was no big deal because oil was about, I think, ninety or hundred dollars per barrel, and heading on the way up to one hundred and twenty, which would be the peak a couple of days. Later. So really, there wasn't any compelling reason to uh, pursue access to the lucrative EU uh, five hundred million person market. Uh, but now it's completely different, you know, for reasons uh, uh, clear to everyone in the audience where prices are lower, you know, pressure, economic pressures are much higher. So there's a huge carrot. Uh, and, you know, these GCC countries are trying to diversify their exports in particular and the opportunity to sink their teeth into, you know, EU consumers is, is, is certainly uh, attractive. There's also an accentuated need for diplomatic support post US withdrawal from the Middle East. I say diplomatic, not security, because I don't see the EU exporting any sort of security assistance, but they can help diplomatically for sure. You know, when you look at a country like Iran, I imagine that what's in the uh, case, in the GCC country's mind is look, uh, we can't contain Iran militaristically, but let's try to contain it diplomatically. And the EU does seem to have some leverage over Iran uh, uh, diplomatically, so so they would like to uh, uh, use that to the greatest extent possible. And one goal that's still important uh, is the GC is the EU as a knowledge and an innovation partner. Uh, you know, many people in the Gulf go to study in university in the EU, and the top EU companies, you know, the companies like Siemens, and uh, uh, they have um, they continue to play an important role in the GCC economies and potential sources of knowledge transfer and, and, and partnerships. Now, there are two reasons for optimism uh, uh, in terms of things, you know, uh, improving. And this may explain, as I say, some of the things that Courtney mentioned and that I'm sensing in terms of the impetus on the ground. The first is energy. OK, and that's even before, you know, this uh, uh, absurd crisis that's been happening over, uh, over the last few months, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the GCC grid. Uh, the Gulf countries have had a grid and a, and a very well functioning grid, uh, and it's slowly integrating with the EU. Uh, it's a sort of piecewise process. It goes GCC, Jordan, I think, Egypt, uh, uh, Libya, <laughs> Morocco, or Tunisia, Morocco, and then up across Gibraltar. And then in principle, it could go around the other way through Lebanon. But if that happens, then, you know, this is uh, a triumph for. Uh, uh, you know, for Immanuel Kant and uh, uh, John Stuart Mill and other sort of uh, leading lights of the Enlightenment, because the, uh, this is an example of the classical liberal case for, uh, for peace and, and, and diplomatic integration on the back of economic integration. If these kind, you know, the, if you just very briefly, climatically, there's a great opportunity for, for trade between the EU and the GCC energy wise, because uh, when it's when you the Europeans use electricity is when we don't use it just now. My electricity bill is like a, a, a low level, uh, whereas Sylvia's is probably very high. And then in summer, mine is super high and hers is super low. So it would be great for us to trade uh, and not have to build up lots of excess capacity. 
Uh, and secondly, uh, uh, and this goes back to the issue of the uh, crisis mentioned by both uh, Sylvia and Courtney, the GCC, the Qatar crisis, there's a, there's a credibility element, which is the GCC interconnection authority, the grid that they've been using to, to trade energy within the GCC was actually fully functional and very professionally done throughout the Qatar crisis. So it did not disrupt and that gives credibility uh, whereas at the moment you're seeing with Russia and Ukraine and all of these sort of political, uh, the GCC, despite their political internal difficulties, have managed to depoliticize in the energy market. And that's probably something which is enti extra enticing now to the EU, given what's happening in Ukraine and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, and then in terms of also uh, uh, solar power, so uh, it doesn't show on the map, by the way, but Saudi Arabia is actually half the size of the EU. Uh, it doesn't, it, you know, the distortions that happen when you flatten a globe. It's actually in terms of land area, half the size of the EU, and Saudi Arabia has a lot of space for solar farms, and the EU is obviously very crowded. So in the EU's long-term renewable energy goals, if they integrate with the GCC, there's great opportunities there. Uh, so those are my, uh, and finally, uh, um, there's increasing, and this is something we'll talk about later, perhaps, Adel, which is a increasing attention to climate change by Saudi and the UAE in particular. Uh, and that could uh, uh, catch uh, the EU's eye because I think, you know, everyone in, in the EU now seems to have uh, climate change as a priority and the EU is always looking for partners, especially because the US, China and Russia seem to be dragging their feet on, on I mean, I know there's a lot of talk in the US, but when it comes to actual action, uh, the uh, EU's far ahead of other, other, other regions and if UAE and Saudi Arabia can even do half of what they are planning to do, that's something that would make them valued partners to the GCC. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, Omar, a lot to uh, unpack there. And I'll, I'll start with a question that you posed, what does the EU want from the GCC? And you highlighted also internally uh, how the EU has many uh, internal issues. And I saw Sylvia taking uh, some, some notes there. So perhaps I'll just loop in Sylvia and ask her that question. What does the EU uh, want from the GCC at the multilateral level? Uh, but also at a bilateral level, what are the strongest uh, relationships there and do these and how do these supersede the, the multilateral uh, mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you, Adel. And the thanks to Courtney and Omar for great uh, inputs. Well, uh, the question is uh, really direct, but I don't have a, a similarly straightforward answer. Uh, I mean, there is not one single uh, wish that the EU would like uh, to pursue in its engagement with the, with the Gulf, with the GCC. It's clear that there are different uh, agendas. Uh, and uh, uh, the second part of your question about uh, uh, what are the strongest uh, bilateral uh, cooperation uh, frameworks, uh, what are the strongest relationships, uh, tells a lot also about uh, what the, uh, the EU, Europe wants from uh, from uh, from the GCC, from uh, its engagement with this uh, with this region. Uh, it's clear that uh, if we take France, Germany, but also previously the UK, partially Italy, um, they do have their own national policies vis-a-vis -vis individual uh, countries in, in the Gulf, from Iran to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, UAE and Qatar, all included. But also they have uh, uh, their own vision of the region as a whole, which differs a lot. Uh, depending on uh, historical relations, it differs from, uh, a lot in terms of people-to-people uh, -people connections. So when Comes, for, for example, to France, it's very important that uh, uh, France's policies towards the Gulf, uh, despite all the appearance of being shaped by business and military related uh, uh, deals, is actually really very much tied to the presence uh, of, of people, people of origin uh, from that originate from, from, from the Gulf in France, the connections with the Middle East, broadly speaking, and so on and so forth. Um, again, uh, these, uh, these different agendas then uh, are kind of uh, translated into the cacophony of the EU as a um, perception uh, and policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Gulf and the GCC. It's really a cacophony because there is not one strategic vision. And as I said at the beginning, there is also a sort of reluctance by the EU to come up with this strategic vision about the Gulf and the GCC, uh, despite all the declarations, the announcements. There is a, a reluctance in terms in terms of stepping up and taking a major role in dealing with this part of the world, knowing uh, at the same time that uh, um, these two regions uh, that speak to one another also in terms of, you know, uh, processes, of, processes of regionalization and regionalism, um, 
will go uh, in the direction of having to cooperate more. As Omar said, there are uh, there are pressures that uh, nowadays put the EU, the European Union, and the, the, uh, the, the European member states in the course on the course of having to cooperate more with the countries in the Gulf because they are a sort of a gate also to Asia and so on and so forth. Uh, at the same time, this strategic vision, this strategic uh, um, uh, set of priorities is, is lacking. And I think that it's not uh, enough to compile a list of the national kind of priorities and national agendas to get a sense of what the, the EU is uh, uh, wants from, uh, from the Gulf. Uh, of course, the issue of security, as I've tried to articulate, is, uh, is crucial because of the ramifications that the Gulf security has for the broader Middle East and North Africa region and for, for these uh, global uh, connections. But, uh, in, but at the same time, um, although this is uh, important for the EU, uh, there are still uh, um, a, a piecemeal, there is still a piecemeal vision about what uh, security and uh, the contribution of the EU to security in the Gulf uh, looks like. Um, I can just spend a couple of words on uh, a specific, for example, role that the, uh, my country, Italy, played. I mean, the vision, the perception of Italy's uh, contribution to, um, I mean, to security in the Gulf or the engagement with the Gulf is really shaped by domestic uh, priorities. Take the example of the military contracts, uh, the, the selling of weapons, uh, and the way in which, for example, this has uh, uh, amounted to a sort of competition, intra-European competition uh, against, for example, France and other uh, European countries uh, about who gets uh, the most lucrative deals and so on and so forth. And this, of course, uh, is, uh, is, um, is, this, is, is a clear example of a lack of uh, even national strategic vision about, uh, about this region. Thanks. Thanks, Sylvia. And just continuing on uh, on the security uh, discussion and looping in, uh, uh, Courtney, of course, uh, Europe and the US uh, uh, in, under the Obama administration worked to put together the JCPOA deal, which, uh, which uh, President Trump withdrew from. Uh, and when uh, President Biden came in, there was initial hopes uh, to put together a new GC JCPOA. And there are current discussions uh, and negotiations happening now in Vienna. But given the debacle that ha happened in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, what is the appetite uh, in the US for an actual reconfiguration from a JCPOA? And actually, how can Europe trust the US, uh, again, given that it withdrew from a deal? And how can the Iranians themselves trust uh, a potential and the long-term viability of any uh, future uh, JCPOA deal? Thanks. This is an excellent question. I mean, I think there there is in general an appetite for some type of rearrangement of the deal, but in the U.S. But and I do think this is a major sticking point in terms of guarantees. I mean, how do you ensure that the U.S. doesn't unilaterally withdraw again? Uh, for instance, with the next next administration. Um, and I think that's that's one of the major sticking points. Uh, I do think that since the Obama administration, there has been this perception in the Gulf that the US is withdrawing from the region. As you mentioned, Afghanistan, uh, I think there's also under when Biden came to office and even in the run up in his campaign, he talked a lot about human rights and uh, democratization. Last month, uh, the Summit for Democracy was hosted and was a very symbolic gesture towards you know, the US's desire to lead you know, what it sees as a democratic world. And I think that in that sense, that makes some Gulf leaderships, which are not democracies, um, nervous about the US appetite for continued engagement in the region. And so I think what we are seeing in the Gulf, and this, this is vis-a-vis um, -vis Iran as well, is you know, increasingly taking things into their own hands. I mean, we saw last month, uh, perhaps the best example, which was the visit of the Emirati National Security Advisor to Tehran. Uh, this was the most senior level encounter between Iranian and Emirati officials in a decade. Um, last year, Saudi Arabia launched a dialogue with Iran in Baghdad, mediated by the Iraqi government. These are ongoing. And so I think we see more and more the a desire for the Gulf not to wait for the U.S. to have an appetite to um, to do something because you know we've seen what happens that the U.S. can and did withdraw from the JCPOA quite suddenly, and so I think that we're seeing more activist foreign policies uh, in the Gulf and and more engagement in particular uh, with Iran, trying to deal with Iran kind of on their own terms, not just through the eyes of the U.S. Thanks, thanks, Gordon. 
Omar, I'll, uh, I'll go to you. I have a question from the audience uh, on the viability of a future EU uh, uh, GCC trade agreement. But I want to take a step back from that and just ask you, uh, post Al Ola, is economic integration back uh, on, uh, on the table? How do you see economic integration happening in the GCC? Because the FTA is, is part of that uh, uh, discussion. Because we also see the Emiratis, for example, moving ahead with uh, negotiating FTAs of their own. We have Oman. We have the various GCC countries sort of having bilateral approaches towards FTA. So I just want to ask you the first question on economic integration and is it back on, uh, on track? And the second one on the potential for a, uh, a free trade agreement. Now, so ironically, uh, the causation is reverse. And in, in, throughout the 90s, the EU, when the EU was trying to negotiate with the GCC over economic integration, one of the, major, one of the main demands uh, and, and points of consternation from the EU side was that the GCC didn't have a customs union. Uh, and, and, and so get your customs union. So then the GCC countries had to get a customs union first and then they could properly enter negotiations. And then so that was in 2003, the GCC customs union, and then 2008 was a single market. So ironically, an attempt to secure an FTA with, G, with the EU is what has been driving partially uh, GCC economic integration. Uh, and that uh, uh, demand uh, from the EU, uh, I, I imagine is still, you know, still there. Uh, uh, and look, as I say, it, when it comes to trade, you know, the, the, the trade with the GCC, as is with most blocks, is pretty much irrelevant on the economic side to the EU. So it's up to the EU in terms of what political goals it wants. It doesn't gain or lose much either way by, uh, by signing an FTA with, with, with the GCC. The question is, does it satisfy its political and diplomatic global agenda? And would it be something that, you know, uh, uh, confers... Uh, uh, you know, benefits to its prestige. I think that the EU is looking for some something to do, uh, something it could advertise as a successful. Uh, I mean, they had the Mercosur, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, and since then, you know, nothing else is going on. So I think it would be nice, and it would be also a nice way, if, especially for Saudi Arabia and UAE, make sorry progress. To I think to, sorry to drop you. I think there's something also on EU China that that they've been negotiating that was also uh, they've been, okay. So they've been negotiating EU, but that one I think that one's going to be more controversial. We'll see where that one ends up. Uh, but the uh, but the uh, I think they would be especially if, the, if Saudi Arabia and UAE make significant progress on climate change, then I think it would be a nice win for the EU to say, look, they made good progress on the climate. It doesn't cost us anything to give them a deal, so let's give them a deal. Uh, and a precondition for the deal is a, a, is a soundly functioning internal sing common market for the GCC. So in that respect, uh, uh, I see, uh, you know, in general, the negotiations promoting further economic integration in the GCC and, you know, being in a virtual cycle. But it all goes back to, you know, the issues that Sylvia and Courtney uh, mentioned earlier and you in your introduction, which is to what extent the, the, the highest level uh, uh, diplomats in the EU uh, both at country level and at the EU level, have this you know burning desire to get the deal done. If I was in their position, I'd do it. I mean, as I said, what have they got to lose? I mean, it doesn't really make a difference one or the other. So you might as well get the political benefits. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, I think uh, uh, you'd need a whole you know university of political scientists to, to analyze the EU uh, <laughs> and, and how they make their decisions. Thanks, Omar. I you also mentioned the uh, climate change. So I, I want you to expand on this a bit. This has been a big year on, on climate action, uh, and there's been lots of plans coming out of the, the Gulf, some very, very ambitious and uh, perhaps overly ambitious. So I, uh, I just want you to reflect perhaps on some of these plans and how can the EU, poten the EU potentially play a role in, uh, in, uh, in attaining these, uh, these goals and, uh, and plans? So first of all, like the... Uh, uh, there's a big uh, 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 internal pressure, ignoring uh, ignore external pressure, there's a big internal pressure to develop, you know, renewable energy into reduce pollution because the GCC countries, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if, if you're trying to attract foreign direct investment, now there's green investment codes, you know, everywhere in the world. Uh, and so if you're trying to attract foreign investment like Saudi Arabia, UAE and so on and so forth, and you're you know, producing huge amounts of carbon, then it's not going to jive with investors. So that's incompatible with your economic strategy. And secondly, uh, uh, it's, you know, the, the de desalination requirements. Uh, so desalination is highly energy intensive. And if you keep using, you know, gas or oil uh, to, to power the desalination plants, 
uh, it's it's just not economically viable in the long run. So it is just on, on purely economic grounds, it makes absolute sense for the DCs countries to be transitioning towards renewable energies. Uh, and then there's also the political dimension, you know, and diplomatic in terms of you know being able to advertise how look how green we are and so on and so forth, which I think is also is a, is, is potentially important. But I do think the uh, desalination and uh, and uh, economic and, and, and desire to attract FDI is the strongest. Now that doesn't mean to say that uh, they're going to realise their goal. I mean, some of the goals, are without naming names, uh, don't seem to be particularly credible. Uh, but to be honest, you know, now you know everybody in the world seems to be making incredible claims about <laughs> what they're going to do in the next few years. So uh, the GCC is hardly in that boat alone. Uh, uh, but I do think that the UAE, fundamentally, all of the GCC countries uh, have, uh, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, showmanship or making noise for the sake of catching headlines. I think there are, you know, serious internal requirements. Bahrain is slightly different from the other five because we don't have space in Bahrain. Uh, uh, so, but here, you know, so we can't build, you know, huge solar farms uh, and our wind is not enough to get wind energy. We don't have any volcanoes or you know uh, other sources of energy but here the gcc interconnection authority is critical to bahrain's renewable energy goals because if we invest in a saudi solar farm and an emirati solar farm a Amani one we can you know receive our renewable energy goals without having to you know uh, find an extra you know million square kilometers somewhere um, i have uh, another audience question to sylvia i think this time uh, we have a, uh, we have a question that looks at uh, interests versus values, and uh, the question is is about is the EU now focusing more on its interests and put away some of its values diplomacy, not just in the Gulf but broadly uh, across the Middle East, due to of course internal dynamics uh, and regional challenges. Is the EU now more specifically focused uh, on its uh, its interests? We see lots of declarations coming from the European Parliament, for example, on human rights issues uh, in, in the region. But when it comes down to it, uh, there's definitely a sense of realism, from, especially from this, under this current uh, presidency and foreign policy. If you, if you can expand on that. Well, thank you, Adel. Uh, I mean, this question is uh, the, uh, the, the, it's always uh, asked when it comes to the use foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, not just the Gulf, but the MENA region in general, because this uh, mismatch between the pursuing of uh, uh, interests uh, uh, and on, on, on the one hand, and uh, on the other, the, uh, the, the up, up, uh, upholding of values, both internally and externally, is, uh, is what uh, uh, tarnishes basically the, uh, the, the EU's uh, um, action abroad. It's true to say that, uh, again, it's not just specific of uh, the EU's engagement with the Gulf, but it's clear that uh, when it comes to the GCC uh, countries, governments, there is an added layer of complexity, which has to do with the fact that these countries are very attractive in terms of making businesses, business uh, and pursuing these uh, interests, uh, um, mostly private sector related. But on the other hand, there are serious problems when it comes to uh, values, uh, democracy, human rights, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, I mean, going back to the issue of bilateralism, it's clear that, uh, again, for many years, the EU uh, has uh, a sort of um, found a, a middle ground compromise, uh, even within uh, itself so with the member states, whereby the member states would continue their policies of engagement, uh, irrespective of uh, human rights violations by the uh, by some of the GCC countries, uh, while the EU would try, uh, mostly thanks to the role of the European Parliament, as Courtney alluded to, uh, to uh, speak in the name of uh, protecting values. But, I mean, I, I, it's clear that just speaking about values or saying that there are certain red lines without implementing them, without putting certain conditions is not enough, has not been, has not been enough. I don't think that the EU today has shifted towards more, I mean, it's true that it's become a, a pragmatic, has, has, has remained uh, highly pragmatic, but there is this uh, twist in pragmatism, which is called the um, principled pragmatism, as the EU wants to, you know, to project uh, it in the sense that uh, pra the pragmatism of the EU uh, when it comes to foreign policy uh, is always, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, 
sensitive uh, to uh, values and, and, the, and the principles uh, uh, that the EU first and foremost tries to implement internally. I don't think that the EU has been very successful in that, but at least clarifying the fact that there shouldn't be double standards is a first step in this direction. And uh, now it's in the hands of the member states, because we know that most of these issues when it comes to military uh, deals, when it comes to uh, foreign security policy are, are in the hands uh, of, of, of the of member states. It's really uh, up to them to uh, find a more coherent uh, uh, approach uh, when it comes uh, to these issues. Uh, you remember a few years ago, there was a huge spat between Germany and the, uh, Saudi Arabia, or most recently also, you know, what happened between Italy and the UAE when it comes to the selling of uh, military um, equipment and so on and so forth, because of the lack of respect of human rights, because of the uh, interferences and pressures in a number of uh, uh, conflict situations throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Well, these things have been uh, resolved in one way or another because there are important pressures coming from the business uh, community in, the, in all the countries. But I think that overall, uh, there is a, a, a greater awareness of the fact that it's not uh, possible to escape uh, this, uh, this this tension. And that there needs to be, uh, um, you know, really um, a firm, coherent line uh, that uh, all the member states try to, 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 to implement when it comes to dealing with uh, these uh, countries, uh, which doesn't mean uh, putting interests uh, aside, but uh, because they are there and it's not possible to get uh, away uh, with, with them. But at the same time, uh, even just repeating, reinforcing the message that uh, certain standards, certain values need to be um, upheld uh, is the right way to go. And in this sense, uh, the role of, uh, again, the parliament, the multilateral institutions within the EU uh, are trying to, uh, to, to keep up uh, to, this, uh, to this job. Thanks, Sylvia. I think this is also a perfect segue for, to ask Courtney the same question when it comes to the US, when it comes to interest versus values. We've seen definitely under the Trump administration there's been prioritizing, prioritization when it comes to the region of definitely uh, US interests and the Trump administration particularly had very close relations with uh, a number of, of Gulf uh, capitals. We've seen the Biden administration come in, uh, perhaps initially with some uh, tough rhetoric uh, against uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, but that uh, to, to some it has been smoothed, smoothed over to others it has not. We've also seen uh, relations with another capital, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, slightly shaky recently in terms of the F-35 uh, deals. I just want you to reflect a bit uh, on the new U.S. administration and its relationship with the, uh, the Gulf capitals as it stands now. So yeah, it's a great question. And I think that the Biden administration really self-consciously has wanted to distance itself from the Trump administration when it comes to dealing with the Middle East in a transactional way, because that's really kind of how, how the Trump administration viewed the Middle East, um, you know, sold a lot of arms, uh, basically just wanted to make deals. Uh, and I think with the Biden administration, certainly in the campaign, we heard Joe Biden, I believe he called Saudi Arabia a pariah state. I mean, he was came out with very strong rhetoric in terms of putting values at the forefront of democratic values, basically at the forefront of American foreign policy when it comes to the Gulf. And so when he did come into to office, we saw some sanctions of individuals who were thought to be involved in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, um, the declassification of certain CIA documents related to Khashoggi's killing, in addition to uh, you know, suspension of support for the war in Yemen. That said, um, the State Department has approved a $650 million missile sale to Saudi Arabia uh, under the Biden administration. And so the, the way that this has been justified is that this is a defensive for defensive uses only. Um, and so this, this kind of loophole has been, been used to, in Congress uh, to justify this arms sale. And so, you know, I think some for some people, they think that the Biden administration is backsliding in terms of its, its rhetoric about democracy. I mean, you have on the one hand, as I mentioned, the Summit for Democracy and this desire for the U.S. to be a leading light when it comes to democratic governance. And on the other hand, you do have continued weapon sales. And also these, these do make a lot of money um, for, for the U.S. economy. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the, the sale of F-35s to the UAE is um, under is suspended for now. Um, and so we'll kind of see what happens there. I mean, I think there we have seen some bilateral uh, weapon sales from EU states to the UAE. Um, I think there is 
you know, potentially space for other states to step in here. I do think overall, I mean, the U.S. will not, uh, you know, I, I think that that any ideas of U.S. withdrawal from the region are, are really overblown. I mean, the U.S. still has massive military um, military bases within the GCC. So the U.S. will not, you know, completely withdraw. I think it may reframe the way that it enters this, these relationships and may reframe them as, as kind of the need to defend the region and, and stabilize it. Um, and, and I don't think you'll see, you know, as chummy relationships as, as we saw between the Trump administration and, for instance, um, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, but at the same time, I think the economic relationship, the security relationship is still, you know, extremely important. Uh, at the same time, I do think you're seeing a more, as I mentioned before, a more activist, um, more activist Gulf foreign policy emerging vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Also, uh, in, in general, the UAE has reached out to Turkey and Syria, as well as to Qatar. Um, so you see these, these capitals willing to, to carve things out on their own. And also, the, they're seeing a desire to and a need to craft some regional security mechanisms um, if the US you know, is seen as a less reliable partner, which I think there, there was that concern, certainly when the Biden administration came into office considering you know, how much rhetoric there was about you know, the need to align American interests and values. I do think that that, that rhetoric will likely continue, but in terms of action, I think it, it's still unclear how much you know, the US really can um, change its, its, uh, its arrangement towards the GCC, given how much investment is there in terms of the security architecture in particular. Thanks, uh, thanks Gordon. Question uh, to to Omar. As we've seen, like uh, Courtney and Sylvia have, have highlighted many of the challenges happening in terms of uh, GCC's foreign policy with uh, Europe uh, and uh, and the US. There's a new uh, the player, or not a new player, but the player who's exerting more more uh, influence in uh, China. So right now, all of the Gulf foreign ministers are actually in in China, as well as the head of the the GCC uh, in uh, in uh, in Beijing for for uh, meetings. Uh, how do you see the relationship with China uh, playing out and how can China play a bigger role? You know, of course, as Courtney mentioned, that the U.S. remains the, the main security underwriter, but it definitely we've seen Chinese footprint grow immensely uh, across uh, the, the Gulf. Uh, uh, so how, how do you see China playing a bigger role over the future? And can it perhaps one day surpass uh, the U.S. And, and Europe in, in the region? So, I mean, first of all, I'm an economist, uh, uh, but what I, uh, so this is not my area, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer. So I know Courtney oh mentioned that, Courtney mentioned that, you know, as many people do, that there's a huge military footprint still in the GCC. But what do we mean by the US withdrawal? You, what I mean by the US withdrawal is that even though there's these thousands of troops there, they're just not doing anything. Uh, and and it's, there are plenty of chances to do things and they just don't do anything. And people's ships are getting attacked, people are, invading each other's countries uh, and crossing borders and so on and so forth and they literally you know don't seem to be doing anything it's almost as if they're there you know just uh, just for show i don't know i'm not i don't know what purpose they're serving actually i my sense and this relates to your last to the other issue which you mentioned in china my sense is that the only reason the u.s troops are there is to stop china moving in uh, because so much of china's energy comes from the gulf region especially if you include iran and iraq you know in, in the mix and so it's like, well, you know, we're we're a rival of China, so we're not going to let them have security over their. Uh, uh, we want to have leverage over their energy, uh, uh, and I think that's the only reason they're there. Because I don't really think they're serving any other particularly important purpose as far as U.S. strategic interests uh, are concerned, and they're certainly not maintaining security. I don't see much security uh, activity apart from what was going on in the Straits of Hormuz, and I think they're doing their joint operations with their little alliance. Uh, but that's, you know, that's pretty low scale compared to what they could be doing or what they formally did. Uh, in terms of what role China could play, China doesn't have a significant military footprint anywhere outside. Uh, and I don't think it has any interest in, 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 as long as it's getting its oil, to hell with the Middle East as far as China is concerned. Uh, and again, ironically, the, only, the major interest of China in the Middle East is maybe only to gain leverage over the US. Uh, but as a region itself, it sees it as a, as a en convenient energy supply a potentially interesting market in terms of somewhere it can sell its goods. But again, in the large scheme of things, places like the EU, places like China, they're huge compared to the GCC. The GCC is just like a, an, an economic irrelevance to them beyond the fact that they may supply a strategically important good. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the US and China compete over influence in the East, use the Middle East to gain influence and leverage over each other. 
But in the long run, uh, uh, neither of them is going to be flexing any significant military might there, unless it's on a very specific, very sort of surgical strike to maintain a very specific interest. Uh, otherwise, it's up to the Middle Eastern countries to fend for themselves. And that's, you know, Courtney mentioned that uh, Tahnun uh, went to Tehran uh, a, a month ago, you know, which would not have happened as recently as five years ago. Very much, Omar. And on that note, we will end this webinar. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. And we expand on many of these issues in our uh, edited volume, uh, which the link is, is there uh, online. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for joining us. And thank you, Courtney. And thank you, uh, Omar. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.